Welcome to Uncaged, the show that celebrates thought leadership from today's top business leaders. The program provides a voice to amazing executives from around the globe who are shaping the world of business today and mapping the path to the commerce of tomorrow. Today, we're speaking with Shalini Swaroop. Shalini, it's great to see you. Great to see you too. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm excited to have you on the show. And, you know, Shalini is working on some really exciting stuff. She is the Chief Legal and Policy Officer at MCE or Marin Clean Energy, California's first community choice aggregator. Um, we're going to get into what a choice aggregator does and how they function. But before we get there, Shalini, tell us a little bit about your background and your career. Sure. Well, again, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, so I uh, grew up in a suburb of Denver uh, with my sister and my parents, and my parents are immigrants from India. So mm -hmm. I'm really blessed to have an extended family in both the U.S. and India. And I think, as is often the case with um, Asian Americans, you know, I often felt a, like a child of two cultures, you know, and so that childhood as a daughter of immigrants sort of enabled me to better understand the inequities facing communities across the world. Mm -hmm. And so to that extent, you know, I, I know I'm in the energy industry, but I've, you know, volunteered in India and Nepal on human rights work. I went to law school at Berkeley Law, and I've worked in a human on human rights in conflict zone and post-conflict areas. And so all of that really informs the way that I do advocacy for our communities and our customers, especially our communities of color and disadvantaged communities. That's great. And so, I mean, a lot of that work and that background clearly has prepared you for uh, the, the current challenge that you guys are working on at MCE, which is spectacular. Tell us a little bit more about what MCE is working on and, and, and where you play. Sure. So maybe I'll go back to what you first said, which is what the heck is a community choice energy agency? Yeah. So, um, all energy, it has the source of electricity. So, you know, wind, solar, coal, nuclear, and it has how that energy gets to your home or business over the poles and wires. So in California, there's a law that government agencies can replace that source of electricity. So we can replace coal and fossil fuel, natural gas with clean energy like wind and solar and transmit it over the existing poles and wires owned by the electrical corporation to the customer at home. So we're really proud of the work we've done. We're the first community choice energy agency in the state. We serve over 1 million people in 37 Bay Area communities across four counties. So we are really proud of our progress. And actually the movement that we started at MCE is now a statewide movement. We have over 20 sister agencies that serve over a quarter of California's population with clean energy. So over 11 million people. That's higher than the population of some of the states of your listeners that are going to stick in right now. So we're really proud of, of our trailblazing in that, in that way. But as an agency, we're doing so much more around beyond clean electricity. We're really focused on our programs for our customers and our communities, especially those frontline communities who have borne the biggest impacts from the fossil fuel economy. Mm -hmm. And so what's really important to me is to make sure that the voices of disenfranchised folks, communities of color, low-income communities, environmental justice communities are at, front, at the front and center of what we do in our work to move away from the fossil fuel economy and combat climate change. Because we just, we don't have a lot of time. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge undertaking. And I imagine um, you guys really, because you're so informed and because you know what needs to be done, probably there's this level of, oh my God, we got to go, we got to go, we got to make it happen. I mean, how does a community get involved with a group like yours to, to push that forward? Yeah, so as a local government agency, it's really interesting. Community activists and advocates have to come together with their city or town council or their county supervisors and say, we want to form this kind of electricity community choice agency. And so it's funny, we're government agencies, but we're, we're essentially formed from grassroots activism and we're startups in this monopoly electricity world, which has you know, been taking a place for hundred years. So it's interesting, we have the sort of business aspect and competition and the startup. We also have government responsibility and transparency. But we also really have the spirit of activism and advocacy and it's such an exciting place to be. Yeah. Now, I'm hoping you're going to give me a level of optimism here. I mean, how are you feeling about where we are in terms of this path to 
really embracing renewable energy at scale? You know, what's so funny is a week ago, I would have had a different answer for this question, but I just, I literally landed at 10 p.m. last night on a plane from D.C., so I have a different answer now, which okay. is I have met some incredible people in Congress this week working on this issue, and, and I have a lot of hope that we, I know that there's a will, and I know that there is a lot of consensus, and this is something the public wants to see is action on climate change. We have challenges, right? And we have a few specific people who are really blocking this agenda. And yeah. I mean, all we can do is hope that not that people, regular people, people who maybe aren't activists, who aren't, you know, active in their community because they have other things to do. I'm really hoping that we can sort of rise up together and think about how we can work across the aisle and think about how we can help the human race survive. Because I know we're living in times of deep polarization. But it's yeah. really through collective action that we can save ourselves. And so, I mean, you can't work in climate change without being an optimist, right? Because otherwise <laughs> your, your days are very sad. And I will yeah. say I do have sad days, but I, I think ultimately I'm so emboldened by our, our leaders and also our youth. And I think that's something that, you know, it affects them more than it affects me or you. And I really am seeing um, galvanizing of action across so many different generations. It's really inspiring. Yeah, I would say that some of the exciting things that we've seen are in the movement of, I'd say, measurement companies, regulatory bodies that are trying to figure out how to make sure companies are actually measuring in a way that is certifiable and valued. Right. And, you know, we, during Earth Day, we had some interesting discussions with companies that are trying to get involved in some of these ESG goals uh, that are being set, how you build up kind of financial measures for companies to really track their progress. And I was heartened to see the fact that we were building kind of more robust systems in that space. And certainly organizations like yours are making it happen on the ground. So all of those things are spectacular. Are there specific types of sustainable energies that are being embraced more readily than others? Um. I think it depends on what you mean by clean and, yeah. um, you know, for example, solar panels are obviously something that we use a lot of, but if you look at the life cycle of a solar panel, there's Not a lot great. of mining that goes into that. Yeah. And so I think, you know, the best clean energy is the energy you do not use. And so mm. that is why MCE has many funds and programs based on reducing energy usage, reducing gas usage, energy efficiency programs, demand response for programs. You not only are we trying to make the electricity as clean as humanly possible, but we're also trying to reduce it to the lowest level humanly possible. Because again, the best clean energy is the energy you do not use. So, you know, let's shift the gears a little bit and talk about the last couple of years. It's the the fascinating thing, uh, you know, you mentioned that uh, your family uh, was from India. I remember seeing a photo of Mumbai uh, in April of 2020, when basically the pandemic had had everybody staying at home. And it was like, Mumbai, look, anybody who's ever been to Mumbai, it's probably one of the most lively cities you can ever visit. But it was silent and the skies were clean. And, and I was like, oh my God, you know, maybe there's going to be a positive of this pandemic that we'll all travel less, we'll use less energy, et cetera. And I think there may have been a blip of that, but perhaps not really moving forward. I'd just be curious, what really happened over the last couple of years in terms of some of the stuff you guys are working on? And, you know, are there any good learnings from this? Yeah, well, what I think the good learning is that the world can heal. It's mm. right if we stop messing it up. So that's really <laughs> my, my biggest takeaway from the pandemic. But I do think, you know, transportation, at least in California, is actually the biggest source of um, greenhouse gas emissions. It's not the energy sector anymore. And so when you're telling me like, oh, the skies were clear in India, mm. a lot of that has to do with the sheer amount of people and how to get them from point A to point B. Yeah, if we can really clean up our transportation industry. I think we have taken significant steps to get to where we need to be. But it's really hard, especially in, in developing countries. I think the critique, and rightly so, is 
well, how come the US, how come Western countries got to get the benefit of the fossil fuel economy while they were growing in their industrialization and commercial capacities? And now those rich countries are turning around and saying developing countries, you don't get- No, 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 right, yeah. So I think that is a really important point where there's, uh, of course, this is my background coming in as, as, you know, a a human rights advocate is that, you know, when when Western countries or, or developed countries are sort of telling developing countries what they can and cannot do, that to me smacks of colonialism and imperialism. And it, we really need to be careful to make sure that as we move to a, um, a more sustainable climate future, that we're getting rid of those systems that disadvantage so many people and also got us to where we are today. So one of the things that you mentioned, Shalini, and I wanted to pick up on it, was that uh, you said that MCE does a lot of work with your folks to perhaps teach people how they can perhaps be more efficient in their own energy usage. And, you know, I am one of these people who's desperately trying to be super energy efficient. I live a very strange life to your typical American. I don't own a car. I walk to my office. I literally try to have a very, very low carbon footprint, except for one horrible thing that I do, which is I travel on planes constantly. And so whenever I do these things, I fall short. And I'm just curious, um, you know, how do you get people to really embrace that kind of on a local level so that they feel like they're making some level of change, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think there's there are things we can all do. Of course, it takes money and not everybody has the money to do them, right? Like yeah. get rid of your gas stove, get rid of your gas heater, electrify everything, you know, seal up your house better so that you don't have, you know, like you get better insulation so you don't have to turn on the heat so much. I mean, there's a lot of individual actions we can all take, but I wanna be clear, the vast perpetrators of greenhouse gas emissions are giant corporations. And so of course we should be doing everything we can to minimize our own fossil fuel footprint, but we need to hold those accountable who have been doing this action for decades. And, you know, if they have, you know, record profits, they need to reinvest some of that back into the communities. Yeah. I love that. And, and, you know, it's funny because I listen to you and I see the sustainable economy opportunities there as well right? Every company that's developing new products and services and solutions in this space, that's really where you're going to see this acceleration and growth going forward, right? I mean, there's companies that are working on insulating things better. There's companies that are actually trying to work on the efficiencies of energy. And so embracing that stuff, I think, is key for sure as well. And I'd just be curious now, I mean, looking out this year, 2022, for me, Shalini, this seems like such a big number, such a such a futuristic year that we're supposed to be in coming out of the pandemic. I'd be curious to see what's on the agenda this year for you guys. Well, I mean, gosh, there are so many ways to answer that question. We have just filed um, with our regulatory agency here in California, the California Public Utilities Commission. Mm -hmm. We have filed an eight year, $188 million application to do energy efficiency programs in our four counties. So that is something we are spending a ton of time and effort on because we wanna make sure that we can get that, you know, get those programs to our communities. Another way we're doing that, I just got back from DC is all, all week I was talking to our Congress members asking for more money for electric vehicle chargers, for battery backup systems, for city towns and fire or city halls and fire stations when the power goes down, because it goes down a lot in California. We are also asking for money to reduce asthma in low income households by reducing those gas appliances. So those are the things we've been really pursuing at the congressional level, even yesterday, right? So this is hot off the press, you know, yesterday, hopefully by the time this comes out, we have made some progress on those things. But I think there's also a really big federal opportunity in terms of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that came out last year and is really just beginning to get implemented now. We hope to see federal funding coming down for clean energy and infrastructure programs. And I think those are incredible opportunities that we need to be taking care of. But, you know, on the micro level, I'll tell you what, we have bought 100 batteries to give out to our medically vulnerable customers who rely on devices to live. Right. And when we have so many frequent power outages, there are big problems here. Medications go wrong. These are expensive medications. Right. Beans turn off that need to be on. 
So that's something that we're doing even on the micro level. We have discount programs for renewable energy. We, I mean, there's so much that we're doing at MCE. Sometimes we say we have a listicle approach to what we do because it's just more, 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 but we're really doing everything we can for our communities. And then yeah. also set an example for California and the country. Yeah, no, I can see that it's a beacon effort that you guys are offering and certainly impacting things not only on the local level, but also state. And it sounds like based on this heartening trip that you just had in, in, in D.C., um, maybe you'll galvanize support for getting everyone to embrace this across the nation. Shalini, it's been amazing speaking to you. If someone wanted to reach you, where should they find you? Yeah, they can find me um, at MCE, we're mcecleanenergy.org, and they can email me directly, swarup, S-S-W-A-R-O-O-P, as in Paul, at mcecleanenergy.org. Great. So we've been speaking with Shalini Swarup. Uh, she is the Chief Legal and Policy Officer at Marin Clean Energy, MCE, California's first community choice aggregator. We've been speaking to her about the state of shifting the country the world, her local community to a more clean approach and how individuals get energy, but also not only a broader shift in that area, but also being more equitable in that process and making sure that we bring these solutions to disadvantaged communities, individuals that need these services and perhaps might not be economically able to actually make that shift so easily. So incredible to speak with you today, and we look forward to having you back on Uncaged. Thank you so much. Cheers.